um, I'm Andrew Hancock. I'm a principal analyst in the standards team based in uh, Christchurch at Stats New Zealand, uh, where I've been working for the past 34 years on uh, classifications, concepts, metadata and coding systems. Uh, I'm also currently the chair of the United Nations Committee of Experts on International Statistical Classifications. And uh, we're just going through the process at the moment of organising uh, our first meeting face to face in six years uh, next month in New York. Uh, a lot of topics around modernisation and improving the way classifications are actually uh, developed and maintained uh, globally, uh, which will help us domestically because uh, it's time to change because the way we do things has become rather antiquated and um, difficult. So just really going to talk about uh, the international um, social classifications, why we need them, issues they create, uh, a bit about governance, uh, practice change considerations around uh, user concerns for classification management, a bit about future thinking and direction, uh, a bit about concept-based classification management, because that's where Stats New Zealand is, is at and is heading. Uh, we overview of SCOS and RDF, which I'm sure you you know inside out, but I'll just uh, reference that. A uh, couple of finish up with a visualisation of, of what we're talking about and then just wrap up with a conclusion. So hopefully you can get it all done in the 25, 30 minutes. So the international classifications really came around in 1947 with the creation of the United Nations and the creation of the Statistics Division. And they set up an expert group to develop industry and product classifications to help um, with the development of a global economic policy in the post-war recovery period. That expert group on industry and products classifications continued its work for about the next 50, 55 years, um, working on updating the classifications to reflect uh, changes in industry activities and obviously the range of products that started to become available through the changes in the technology. The expert group uh, has morphed into what's now called the Committee of Experts on International Statistical Classifications. Uh, it is the central body for the current and future work of classifications that are the responsibility of the United Nations Statistics Division, uh, but it also takes on board classifications developed by the International Labour Organization, or the World Health Organization, World Customs, World Tourism, uh, OECD, you name it, they, they, they tend, to, tend to end up in our, our area. Uh, the committee is mandated by and reports to the UN Statistical Commission. Now, the commission meets every year and it is a collection of all the national uh, chief statisticians around the world and executives from the major um, international agencies like OECD, International Monetary Fund, World Bank. And they talk about all things statistics for several days on end. Um, every two years, the committee puts forward a report saying this is what we've been doing uh, and requests permission to undertake revisions uh, and get uh, direction on the work program. The committee also coordinates the International Review Programme uh, for all agencies and administers the International Family of Statistical Classifications, which can be found on the UN website uh, as linked there. Um, that's basically a list of all the known international standard classifications used for official statistics, uh, whether they're international standards or not. Uh, it's sorted by domains under the classification of statistical activities, which is also embedded in the STMX um, framework um, and we've just done an exercise on actually revising that statistical activities classification so the website's going to update uh, in, a, in a wee while but fundamentally the group's there to support principle nine of the fundamental principles of official statistics and that is the use by statistical agencies in each country of international concepts classifications and methods promotes the consistency and efficiency of statistical systems at all official levels so why do we have international classifications? Some of us think it's it's logical and common sense that we have them, and others really do question the, the, the value of them and why. Um, but it comes back to the need for standard concepts and definitions and classifications to ensure we get a consistent approach to classifying statistical data uh, to support global policy initiatives such as the Sustainable Development Goals or help us understand uh, climate change or to define uh, emerging uh, discussion areas like digital economy, blue economy. Uh, in theory, they provide a simplification of the real world and a framework for collecting, organising and analysing data, uh, not only statistical, but also administrative. So we 
we have classifications which are used for uh, purely for official statistics for the collection of data. We also take on board classifications which may be used for analysing data which aren't used for collection purposes. Uh, the main thing is they provide a framework for international comparability and a basis for national development. So countries can pick them up and use them as is, or they can choose to adapt them. And of course, they can always uh, adapt, uh, create your own things, as often Australia and New Zealand will do. Fundamentally, they're used for collecting and organising statistical information in a standard way, uh, for aggregating and disaggregating data sets in meaningful ways for complex analysis. Uh, supporting policy and decision making and at the international level uh, and most importantly for assisting developing countries and their and their official statistical programs because naturally a lot of the countries don't have capacity or classifications experts to actually develop their own classifications so we um, work to try and enable that but there are undoubtedly numerous issues with classifications um, firstly just understanding the need for them and the lack of encouragement or support by international agencies and national stats officers to adopt them. We're all special, we're all unique. Uh, why should we do the same as everyone else? Because we like to do things our own way. So there is that that challenge. Um, and it's also not helped by the fact that it's very difficult to undertake a stock take audit of what's been used, how it's been used and why it's been used, despite the best efforts of the stats division to do a regular questionnaire of national stats officers. Obviously, uh, obtaining international consensus and input into the development and maintenance uh, is challenging when you've got 194 recognised countries in the UN. Um, not that all of those turn up to the Committee of Experts or all of them are involved in discussions, but we do have a massive uh, challenge both with cultural, legal and language issues in trying to get consensus. And then there's the length of time taken to implement them at the international level. We have countries still using classifications developed in 1958, 1968, let alone getting them onto the current versions of industries or occupations or qualifications or research. We're also hampered by the fact it's not a central global repository for them. Yes, we've got the UN Stats Division webs page and the International Family, but they're all stored in different formats, primarily in HTML and PDF on the UN website. Uh, obviously still got hard copy, uh, all the time series concordances and mappings are in Excel. Uh, they're spread all over the world, uh, depending on the agency, uh, and that has a massive impact on search and discovery and dissemination. So we're looking to actually try and sort some of that out with this new approach that we're going to look at. Uh, the traditional approaches of using sequential codes and parent-child category relationships, single labels, um, all the development of classifications are still constrained by the mentality of you've got an A4 page in front of you or a computer screen and the width that provides, or even the, the structure of an output table with the stub headings and the, head, and the column headings that you, know, you can only have so many characters in your labels, you can only have one, one category, um, and on it goes. Um, you've got no flexibility and you also can't get um, context and fluidity uh, in, in and the classifications are very rigid uh, and very hard to change, but also very difficult to implement because of that. There's also the ongoing issue of what is the official standard to be used. And metadata is a good example where you have SDMX, DDI, ISO 11179 and Dublin Core. What is the standard? They are all standards. Which one shall I use? Well, I want the standard. And we get into this whole circular debate around what is the standard? What are you trying to achieve? Um, and here are, here are examples of metadata standards. I don't like SDMX, so I'll create DDI. Well, I don't like either SDMX or DDI, so I create ISO 11179. I don't like those three, so I'll create double core. And what we end up having is a proliferation rather than a rationalization because of everyone's concern that doesn't quite meet my needs and I want something different. And my, my requirements for a standard are different from your requirements for a standard. So that is an ongoing challenge for us. And there's no simple solution to that other than Let's just take the whole lot and get rid of them and create one, one for everyone, see what happens. Um, but the, the critical um, issue here is that we've got cyclical review processes, and these can be on 5, 10, 15, 20 year bases, depending on the organisation. The International Labour Organisation release a new occupation classification every 20 years. They've just commenced a 10 year programme of work to update it. 
and they see that uh, getting that done in 10 years is quite fast. We've just done the international industry classification in two years. Uh, they'll be released in March next year. So you've got this great disconnect in how long things take to do because of um, the processes and people sticking, organisations sticking to process for the sake of it. But most importantly, it's because these review processes are designed for human consumption. We need a page in front of us for humans to be able to read and understand and, and um, interpret as opposed to putting more of a focus on what it means for machine to machine consumption. Machines don't care about codes and descriptive text or what's on the page. They just need a, a line of code that says do this, do that. Um, so we're trying to bring a bit more of that mentality into the uh, whole process. Well, key problems. Well, I like to sort of talk about the field of dreams mentality that we you know we create a standard that will get used. The, the notion that you build it and they will come. So there's a lot of that uh, behind what is currently being done. Uh, there is a need. Let's create something. Everyone will use it. And domestically, we're having this uh, massive debate around how we resolve that issue um, because we're currently going through a process in Stats New Zealand uh, across the data system of introducing mandated standards. But we've already had statistical standards out there and because no one's complained about them, we assume they are fine. We don't actually know how they're being used, where they're being used, uh, whether the content's right, um, and are they of any value, yet we still keep producing them because we are creating the standard and it will get used. Um, and then there's the Lord of the Rings mentality where, you know, one standard to rule them all. Here is the standard, you must use it. And we're all special, we're all unique. There are reasons why we can't use it, whether it's cost, resource, uh, IT systems, whatever. And ultimately, we've now reached uh, a, a critical part of the game of Jenga, where we've continued to create these rigid square boxes. We've continued to stack them on top of each other. And now we're at the point that they're all starting to fall over because our classifications have run out of space. We can't add new content to most of the international standards because we've used up all the code patterns, we've used up all the available spaces within the current level. So you then get into the issues of do we create more levels? If we create more levels, then you have to change the code patterns. If you change the code patterns, that affects the IT systems, that then affects the time series, and you get into a greater level of detail, which may be beyond the, the actual need. Uh, there's no scope for model for context. There's not all flexibility in approach. Uh, we can't have multiple concepts or entities. There's no ability to create aggregated or derived link views because everything stand alone and needs to be mapped using a concordance or correspondence. So if you want to take a data story uh, and start with a research classification and want to know how that links to qualifications, well, you can do that. You can map the two. But if you want to bring in occupations, you then have to map both those classifications, research and qualifications to occupation. If you want to bring an in industry, you then go and map occupation to industry and industry back to research and industry back to you know, qualifications. And it becomes very messy and complicated. And you've also got the issue of is it an operational concordance to move data between systems or is it a theoretical concordance mapping that tells you how the classifications map to each other? Or is it a predominant concordance where you take the proportion of data and say, OK, this is the most likely single and have one to one matches as opposed to one to many? And there's no uptake of current ontological taxonomical thinking as we're still driven by statistical processes, statistical silos and the needs of the statistical production system within the national stats offices. So in terms of governance, this is just a couple of illustrations of the type of uh, governance models that are currently existing. So at the international level, um, we have the committee, we have national stats officers, we have regional agencies, international organisations. They all sort of work together, but they also all work independently. They all, they may, the national stats officers may report to the international organisations or the regional agencies. And then overlaying that is the Statistical Commission, which is sort of the all-encompassing, all all-powerful um, controller of all this. Um, but it, it's there aren't definitive direct links and, 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 and uh, mandatory requirements to go through the Commission because the international organisations have their own governance models and their own processes, which may run in parallel or at odds with the Statistical, sorry, statistical Commission processes. In the national context, we have uh, a standard approach that we identify as stakeholders, you create advisory groups out of those stakeholders, they work together to provide the information to the project team to do the work for the development. 
um, that project team has a steering committee as oversight to tell if it's doing the right things, if it's going in the right direction, if it's on time, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then in the New Zealand context, that will then go up to the chief government data steward if it's going to be a mandated standard for use across the full data system or the government statistician if it's for official statistics only. And the problem with both these models are they are not responsible dynamic. They are time consuming and um, problematic because it takes so long to get through the process. Both models have different interpretations of what a revision means. Is it a major revision? Is it a minor revision? Is it a um, targeted update? Is it a refresh? Do we call it version 1.0 or version 1.1, depending on the scale of change? Is it Rev 1, Rev 4? Is it uh, a scared 2013 or 2018? We've got no consistency in how we actually define and, and label our classifications. And also, there's no big stick for compliance. It's all very much a slap over the wrist with a wet bus ticket if you don't comply. Um, and we're having, a, again, a big debate around that here in New Zealand because our legislation's just changed around the new Data and Statistics Act, which supposedly gives the Chief Government Data Steward and the Government Statistician more powers uh, to mandate. But we've still got the ongoing issues of uh, timing, timing, IT systems, cost, and have we got enough people to actually justify doing it? We still can't come back and force them. We can only shame them and say, oh, you haven't adopted it. Uh, so what's the point? So in terms of practice change considerations, we're still heavily in a Eurocentric Western model of mutual exclusivity and statistical balance type things where we don't encourage or adopt uh, the thinking of Indigenous Context, for example, in New Zealand to our Maori, the Maori worldview is very fluid. It's about familial relationships uh, and context, whereas our classifications are colonialistic and Eurocentric, one category, one code, that's what you must use. There's no scope for change or fluidity or context. The ongoing issue of IT systems with abbreviations and version numbers hard coded. Uh, our overseas trade system. We tried to change the abbreviation on our um, trade classification from NZHSC to put a year on the end of it to simplify things in the system. 400 store procedures where the abbreviation NZHSC was hard coded. Massive piece of work to actually change that. Um, and then there's ongoing reluctance to change. Why should we change? Because it's it's working for us. What what What's the point? And also the sphere of innovation. Why should we change? Robots are coming, you know, all those sort of scary things. Um, we're looking at the impact of digitalization and digital metadata in machine readable format as a way forward. So greater use of something like an SDMX API versus a standalone classification. Uh, the ongoing issue of what about the time series? We can't change because of the time series and there are ways and means of mitigating time series which enable you to do stuff so we don't get hung up on that. But also getting people to let go. We want to be able to enable users to describe and classify their data how they want to match their data sets within consistent guidelines as opposed to impose these rigid classification structures and say this is what you must use. But the biggest challenge is educating users to this new way of thinking and the benefits that will come with it. So obviously data is sourced from more um, variety of places than it was 10, 20 years ago, GPS, ATMs, supermarket scanners, you name it, it's there. There's greater volume and variety, and the standards don't keep up. And this is sort of the reflection of the social media world where everything's about now. People's attention spans are only focused on that piece of information while it's up on Instagram or, or TikTok or whatever, and then something else comes along and they've moved on. We can't keep up with that. Uh, so we've got to try and find ways of doing that. Some of the best ways are using relational, relational databases, uh, computer created matrix software taking greater uh, account of ontological engineering, but most importantly, semantic web technology and, and putting the focus back on the words and not the codes. Uh, so concept-based classification management systems are the way forward. Stats New Zealand has uh, a vision and philosophy which it's been working on for the last 10 years, uh, called, which has evolved into this thing called ARIA, uh, which is the tool. Um, we haven't evolved the philosophy as we would like because of uh, the need to mitigate existing legacy systems. But we have been working uh, with the vendor who, who are based in North America on evolving this into a global system. So we've developed ARIA from a vision of philosophy from a global perspective for which Stats New Zealand is the first cab off the rank to use it. Statistics Canada are also using it. 
and we've got other agencies like the Food and Agriculture Organisation, uh, OECD, starting to look at how they could actually take that vision and philosophy. Um, and in the New Zealand context, we've also now got the new New Zealand strategy for a digital public service, which is going to actually impact on the way we, we do a lot of our work uh, in the digital space. And for which this methodology that we're looking at will actually support. So it's about moving to a user driven dynamic content, trying to do stuff in real time uh, so that we're not doing five year cyclical revisions on a classification to produce something that's out of date by the time we finished. Uh, it's also trying to enable us to use the technology to get more market intelligence uh, using wikis, discussion forums, that sort of thing. Um, it's about adding value to the data by increasing the content and metadata that can be created. An A4 page in a book doesn't allow, allow you to do anything. Um, so we want to expand the data narrative by bringing in more um, content and more metadata and to do that um, semantic webs and the entity models that go behind it are the way forward. Um, it's about getting greater integration of administrative and statistical concepts and using concepts as our starting points around semantic consistency across the standards and getting greater reuse of existing content by storing once and sharing across multiple locations. So if you change something in one place, it will flow through to the other places it needs to be. Uh, the system of national accounts, for example, will define institutional sector. Um, the balance of payments manual will also define institutional sector, but it has not cut and paste the definition from the system of national accounts. Uh, it is someone has copied it and typed it and made changes slightly. So if the SNA changes, how it describes um, institutional sector, that could then be flowed directly across into the balance of payments manual. So that's the sort of direction we want to take. Um, it's getting rid of these stupid, and I'll use the word stupid, um, cyclical revisions because they're labour intensive, uh, cost and time, resource hungry, and as I said, at the end of the exercise, we're still only at the starting point. We haven't actually made any progress. Um, so our move is towards the use of more APIs and integration of systems and more conceptual modelling and metadata modelling. So the methodologies behind it all, uh, better use of service oriented architecture, um, open source uh, where we can, uh, so we're not constrained to a single platform, which poses problems in terms of changing. Uh, greater use of SCOS and XCOS, we haven't quite moved into the XCOS space yet, but we're, we're starting to look at that. Um, integration of metadata standards such as SDMX and ISO 179. So it's very much about taking the best bits of each rather than saying we're going to be uh, strictly SDMX or strictly DDI or strictly ISO 179. We take the bits that we that are useful to us. Greater use of taxonomies and thesauri, um, ontological engineering and concept management. So we get a mix of structured and semi-structured data. Um, Looking at multiple output views because you know a lot of the classifications you can't look at cross cutting or sectoral views of them, particularly industry. If you want to look at what is tourism, what is health, uh, what is biotechnology, you you can't actually get those cross cutting views. So we're trying to enable that, um, and also get uh, multiple labelling options. And one of the challenges of working with the ABS, the Australian Bureau, and coming up with a joint classification is how we describe things. Yes, both Australia and New Zealand are similar, and what we uh, have in our labour market and our qualifications, but our terms aren't quite the same. We use the term roofer for someone who does everything to do with constructing a roof, whereas in Australia you have roof plumber, roof tiler, and roof something else. Um, so what do we do in the classification? Do we have three separate categories just because Australia has three, or do we have one, or do we try and embed the term roofer with one of those other three or, or what? So um, what we now want to have is the ability to get away from that sort of constraint that we can just put them in as appropriate. Uh, everything's XML based, so you can transform it into SDMX, DDI, whatever else uh, for output of transfer and bring in more automation. And it's about educating and changing the international thinking. And it's a slow process, but we're starting to get some traction. Uh, so metadata modeling is the, the, the fundamental thing that we're, we're using, um, starting with a concept. Uh, which may have relationships to any other concepts or sub concepts. Um, each concept's unique. Has uh, forms a scope uh, in terms of being having a definition, and then under the, within that definition, you can create a set of all the words that are relevant to that uh, concept. And that allows us to sort of look at the intentional and extensional approaches. 
So with intentional or concept is listed with the properties or categories that the concept must have to be part of the set. So you know, the concept of country, for it to be a country, it must be independent, it must be a geographic entity and or an administrative region. Uh, for, it, for the extensional side of it, you know, what is a country? Well, it's Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, whatever. So that, that's, that's the distinction there, which we can't easily really do um, for a lot of classifications. But the critical thing is trying to enable everyone to talk about the same concept category and content in the same way, something that theoretically is happening with, with the standards. But in reality, when we talk about ethnicity or whether we talk about religion, we're actually talking about different things. And the same as I just alluded to with the occupation, you know, roofer, what's a roofer? What's a roof tiler? Are we actually talking about the same thing? We think we are, but perhaps we're not. Uh, but most importantly, it's around getting search and discovery, retrieval and interoperability easier. We can't do great search and discovery across the classifications. So this is where SCOS comes in, and I'm sure you're all familiar with SCOS. Um, you know, the idea of getting to a neural network model, uh, the use of unique resource indicators on each entity, which will give us so much more flexibility. Um, we can organise content into informal hierarchies and networks using predefined uh, concept schemes. Uh, the URIs um, remove the constraint for us of single descriptors or mutually exclusive labels. We can do so much more. Um, introducing synonyms and aliases of categories. And getting more granular metadata and easier integration and sharing of concepts and content. And work is underway with the digitalization of the major international economic standards. So as I said, the system of national accounts, the balance of payments manual. Uh, we've got a massive uh, work program on what the UN have around um, integrating those into digital formats so that you can keep them consistent and you don't have to have two 1000 page volume books sitting on a shelf. Um, and if you update one, it flows through the other and vice versa. Um, RDF or resource description frameworks. Um, again, we get the unique web identifiers for each resource or entity. Um, the triple, which gives us the subject, the predicate and the object, which is so powerful for us. It allows classification content to be disassembled into the component parts and then we can re reassemble it back as it was or into other shapes and forms um, so that we can get users to find views, uh, assist users with their data better than trying to force them to a standard and then say, OK, well, why haven't you used the standard and going through all those processes because the standard doesn't meet their needs. Uh, we get into graph networks and, and query languages such as Sparkle uh, to retrieve and manipulate data. But most importantly, again, and I'm sorry I keep using the word most importantly because everything's important here uh, from my perspective, um, enabling faster and more dynamic updating. Get away from five to 10 year cycle processes. We want to be dynamic. We want to have static copies available for use with working copies underneath, which can be updated on a regular basis through a governance model. Um, and you just refresh on an annual basis, for example, whatever you agree with with the, with the key users. So this screen is just the, the basic model behind the ARIA system on, on the classification entity. It's just your standard uh, metadata model of uh, classification code level versions and how they link. And then as a rough visualization of where we're headed to with, with the system, um, this is sort of what it sort of looks like. You have the concept of industry. Uh, it has an agreed definition. The concept of industry has a relationship to other concepts, whether that could be things like agriculture, construction, energy, energy manufacturing, or it could be more macroeconomic type things like CPIs, um, GDP, non-profit. Um, those related concepts uh, could also be um, part of the category set. And the category set are all the words that, that you could use to categorize industry. And that's a dynamic list, constantly updated. Um, eventually, we were looking at a uh, stock exchange approach that the most, the ones most regularly and commonly used would stay in there, and the ones over time that you could see were, were diminishing the usage would actually drop out to try and automate the process. Um, we're still having the philosophical debate about whether everything should be a concept or whether it can be split into a concept or a category. Um, this idea of having the related concepts uh, and, and that sort of uh, linkage analysis to produce views like GDP by industry, which is very difficult to do at the moment because it's all standalone bringing together stuff. Um, the notion of the code bank is there because we want to use codes as uh, placeholders for data rather than building blocks for classifications. So that code bank would be a user defined um, spec of available codes. Ideally, we'd sort of standardize it and say, OK, for the concept of industry, here are the sort of codes you should use in terms of 
you know, the length and the type, whether the alphanumeric and, and what links, but users could define what they want uh, and apply it to the words and build their hierarchies. And out of all that, you can get things like standard classification, like the international industry classification or the North American industry, or you can create a sectoral view, um, such as tourism, and it becomes so much more easier doing it this way. Um, so the benefits are that everything's timestamped and each entity has a unique URI. Um, we bring in APIs to um, enable integration of systems and to link content. So whether the API is out of our ARIA system to other systems or will we consume APIs from those systems? And we're currently working with the Tertiary Education Commission on a project around occupation where we will drop the ANSCO classification um, and put in the US ONET system, which is currently stored in ARIA. We will use APIs to link to the online career platform that the Tertiary Education Commission has used. And that way we can manage the classification and the users will then be able to link using that classification through from one system to the other to get all the skills and competencies and roles and career guidance information that sits on the Tertiary Education Commission website, stuff that our classification can't pull in. Uh, so we're also taking that uh, on board for some of the international work as well. Um, it's around getting customised. We've got customisable life cycles and approval processes. Uh, you can restrict content to internal groups or external groups. You can have external groups uh, contribute and control. Um, and then content can be disseminated in multiple formats uh, into Word, Excel, SMX, DDI, PDF, um, HTML, SAS, Starter, you name it, we can do it because it's all in XML. Uh, everything's linked. Uh, so we don't have to, and the correspondences or concordances can now be automated as opposed to manually done between versions because you're, you're studying at the concept base and ultimately bringing more AI machine learning and to reduce human interaction in the future. So to finish up, um, it's obvious that the traditional methods of management of classifications no longer work. Uh, semantic web metadata modeling is the best way forward. Uh, we need to modernize and change our governance models and take it away from a very bureaucratic hierarchical approach. Uh, we will be able to bring in dynamic and real-time change and the ultimate uh, goal of cost reduction is around doing ourselves out of a job. So eventually if all this works, uh, on the one hand there's probably no need for a national stats office, uh, but on a lesser degree there's probably no need for classifications experts because it can be automated and done through machine, through AI and machine learning and the algorithms. Um, and you'll get greater consistency and greater autom automation. So that's about half an hour. Um, that will do for now. Um, if there are any questions, um, happy to take those questions.